Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2019. Can I ask that everyone turn off their mobile devices and, and put them away, please? We have apologies from Alec Cole Hamilton this morning. Um, agenda item one um, is um, consideration of correspondence on the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against women. Can I welcome Emma Rich um, this morning, Executive Director of Engender, and I believe you're going to give us an opening statement, Emma, please. Thanks very much. Um, thank you to the convener and committee for inviting Engender to give evidence on CEDAW, which is the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Since ratifying CEDAW in 1986, the UK has had legal obligations to respect, protect and fulfil women's human rights. The view of equality in CEDAW is based on the principle of substantive equality between men and women, and this acknowledges that equality of opportunity and equal treatment is insufficient to redress generations of ingrained disadvantage. It compels system change and a fundamental shift in the distribution of power, resources and safety. The five-year CEDAW examination cycle has just concluded its scrutiny of women's rights in the UK, and it's a timely moment for this committee to consider its response. Seeing international obligations work for women in Scotland is a strategic priority for Engenda. We use our special consultative status with the UN to open up space for Scottish women's, human rights and other civil society organisations to engage with the process. And over the past two years, we've consulted with women and with organisations to identify priorities for action by both Scottish Government and UK Government to bring to the CEDAW Committee's attention. We have been the lead organisation in writing shadow reports for Scotland and also for the four nations of the UK, along with colleagues at the Northern Irish Women's European Platform, Women's Equality Network Wales and the National Alliance of Women's Organisations. Our evidence to the UN Committee is available in our shadow reports, but the critical issues for women in Scotland and across the UK are familiar. We called for action on violence against women and girls, on women's underrepresentation in council chambers and the Scottish Parliament, on equality in employment, education, healthcare and social security, and a response to the crisis in social care. The CEDAW Committee's concluding observations pick up on many of our concerns, including incorporation of CEDAW into Scots law, Brexit and women's rights, austerity, gender mainstreaming and data. They also make a number of specific and detailed recommendations that are relevant to Scotland and within the powers of the Scottish Government and Parliament. In our written evidence to the committee, we invited you to consider three issues, including how this committee might best track action in response to the CEDAW committee's concluding observations, how this committee might use the concluding observations and articles when developing its thematic inquiry work on women's equality and rights, and how this committee might act to defend the treaty bodies, including the CEDAW committee, that are being undermined by the current UN funding crisis. I would also add a fourth, how this committee might ensure that the recommendation from the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership that CEDAW be incorporated into Scots law be best achieved. Thank you. Thank you um, for that. Um, you mentioned um, some of the concluding observations there, and there's obviously quite a range that are um, of concern um, regarding women's inequality in Scotland. Incorporation, obviously, we also have some work around the public sector equality duty. Um, this committee has been particularly interested in quality of data. It's something that comes up um, quite a lot, and I'm sure colleagues would agree that it's essential if we're going to have a collective understanding of um, the different lived experience of women and girls and men and boys that, that we get that. Um, another matter that jumped out was action on sexualised and sexist bullying um, in schools. Obviously that is not all of them, there is a number of things there, but those were just some that jumped out at me. Um, in Engender submission, um, you also stated that there'd been less of a focus, less of a Scotland specific focus and gave a couple of um, reasons to that and raised it as a concern. Um, how do we change that? What actions can this committee take? Are there actions for the Scottish Government um, to, to take in, in addressing that? Thanks very much, convener. I think that's a, an excellent question. I think 
for very good reasons, um, which are namely that the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland currently doesn't have a government. Um, the international committees that we have seen in the last um, couple of cycles of both CEDAW and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights have been very concerned about the failure to act on um, specific human rights violations in Northern Ireland. And the one that the CEDAW committee was particularly exercised by was um, access to abortion health care. Um, but overall, they're concerned that lacking a functioning government means that anything across human rights is, is not um, being acted upon. And we have observed um, through the, the actions of the, the CEDAW committee a real lack of bandwidth within the committee. They examine five states in five days, um, giving one day to each examination. And during the lunchtime of a state examination, they meet with civil society organisations from the state that they will be examining the next day. So it's an incredibly intense um, working arrangement. Committee members are unpaid um, and so must um, fulfil their committee obligations outside of their paid work if they have some. And all of this leads to um, a real difficulty in getting enough space to get a grip on the materials. And we think one of the things that um, is troubling to them is understanding the devolution settlement of the UK. Uh, we think that's exacerbated by the way that UK government presents information to the CEDAW committee. Often the state party report does not adequately differentiate between the four nations of the UK in terms of legislation, programmes, expenditure um, and other features of policy making. And it just becomes very difficult for civil society to try and unravel that um, to um, satisfy the committee. Um, we did in the previous cycle, the previous um, five years of CEDAW, uh, as in gender, bring over to Scotland one of the CEDAW committee members, Professor Nicholas Brune from Norway. Um, and because the committee members are unpaid and cannot access expenses for making such travel, it's incumbent on civil society or national human rights institutions to pay for that to happen. But it was our perception that that did enable a deeper understanding of the situation in Scotland and a more fulsome engagement with Scotland's devolution settlement in the concluding observations that we saw in the previous round. So um, that is beyond our financial means sometimes, and particularly if um, critical committee members live um, in the global south. It's just too expensive for a, a small charity um, to fundraise to do that work. Um, so I suppose what the committee um, can do to play its part in raising the profile of CEDAW and the importance um, is what we have asked you um, in our submission, which is to um, respond formally to the CEDAW concluding observations, to track the concluding observations, which are the committee's recommendations for action, to consider how those apply best in a Scottish context, and in doing so, um, signal that Scotland, as part of the Four Nations of the UK, is very interested in this human rights instrument uh, and in what realising it could achieve for women's <coughs> rights and equality. And in terms of actions for the, the Scottish Government, perhaps? I think a similar set of actions for the Scottish Government. Um, so um, one of the uh, recommendations that has come from the First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership has been to develop a mechanism which could process the outputs of all of the treaty processes. Um, so all of the eight that the UK uh, is signed up to have kind of similar, different, overlapping processes, but all produce a set of concluding observations. I think the last time there was an estimate of how many are outstanding, it was in the region of 600, which is quite a, a number of um, individual recommendations for any government to process. But we think a systematic approach is required. Thank you. Um, Gail Ross is going to come on to, to ask you about funding um, after this, and you did touch on some of it in your, in your answer there. But I just wonder if are there any more issues um, around the CEDAW um, committee's um, function and operation that you, you think we should you should know about? We received some correspondence this morning from um, IRAW, which is a Malaysian-based NGO that does a lot of monitoring of the CEDAW um, structures within the UN system. And they advised us that the UK government has now paid its subscriptions, um, which is helpful, but very late and too late for a different budget process to be selected. Um, they were further able to identify that there have been... Um, 
25% cut applied right across the UN system, which is having a particularly negative effect on the treaty bodies, including CEDAW, because they are so reliant on external advisors and experts, um, and the members are unpaid, but the cost of bringing them together for hearings and examinations is critical. So IRAW were able to advise us that um, not only... Um, will the CEDAW committee not be seeing some states which it was due to examine according to their normal cycle of examinations um, but some of the matters referred to it using the optional protocol which is an um, in inquiry um, system so a state can ask the CEDAW committee to investigate egregious breaches of rights it can also refer um, egregious <laughs> breaches of rights to them using a complaints mechanism and um, both of those things are now not happening and some of the circumstances being referred to CEDAW according to IRAW involve um, egregious breaches, including torture, um, mi missing people, um, and other, other instances where the state is failing to act. So these cuts occasioned by um, member states failing to pay their subscriptions has already impeded CEDAW's um, urgent human rights work. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Gil Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Emma. Thank you for coming in. Um, so just to follow on that um, line of questioning, what do you think we as a committee can be doing to put pressure on the UK government to make sure that they actually do pay on time and make things easier? Um, I think it would be very helpful for, for the committee to urgently make clear to the UK its concern in this matter, um, perhaps to ask some questions about why this failure uh, to pay has come about um, and to emphasise the fact that failing to pay has had a disproportionate impact on the treaty bodies that are investigating and examining states in a context in which women's rights are being fundamentally undermined. Uh, I'm just back from a meeting of the European Women's Lobby. Um, I'm the board member for the UK at the moment in Brussels, and we heard from sister organisations right across Europe um, that the rise of populism has brought with it um, profound anti-feminism, uh, anti-feminist action. Um, my colleague from the Czech Republic said that in respect of the Istanbul Convention, which is a Council of Europe Convention on Violence Against Women, um, an, an, an NGO with uh, un, unclear funding source had sent a leaflet to every single household in the Czech Republic telling them that the Istanbul Convention would undermine the family and the well-being of citizens in the Czech Republic. So there are certainly well-funded attacks on women's rights and um, the CEDAW examination process and the optional protocol processes provide quite a rare space at the moment in a global context to explore and investigate women's human rights. And just for the record, how much is the UK's contribution? I'm sorry, I don't have that information. OK. Um, you say in your um, submission that um, th th you're going to have to postpone some sessions... Yes. Is that still likely to happen now? Yes. The CEDAW, so the, 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 um, the funding arrangements at the moment are in relation to the budget for 2018-19, um, which is nearly concluded um, for the UN. And so the cuts to the sessions have already had to take place because they have to be planned in advance. So at the moment, for two consecutive years, um, there will be two sessions instead of three and no optional protocol um, work will be able to be progressed by the committee, um, which is already hugely oversubscribed. Um, there's been one significant optional protocol case uh, in the UK, which came from Northern Ireland on the issue of abortion health care, and that took some six or seven years to wend its way through the system because the demand on the committee massively exceeds their capacity to be able to consider matters referred to it. And um, you talk about um, breaches of rights and stale, states failing to act and, and instances that the, the committee has stepped in, if you like. Mm. If the committee is unable to do that because of the shortfall in funding, are there any other organisations that are picking those cases up? No. OK. Thank you. Um, thank you. Gail, I'm just looking at my list. Fulton. 
convener and, and uh, thanks uh, for coming along and, and your evidence so far. Uh, in terms of the um, Scotland Civil Society response, I know you touched on this in, uh, a wee bit in your, your opening remarks, but how, does, how do you coordinate this response and set priorities from it? Thanks for that. Um, so we um, had a participatory process to identify priorities <coughs> for the Scotland report. Um, we um, put out a call for evidence, which was principally to organisations. Uh, we convened an expert advisory group um, with representatives from all of the national women's organisations, race equality organisations, disability organisations, uh, and um, Professor Nicole Busby, who's um, Scotland's only professor of equality law, uh, with an interest in CEDAW um, and we also um, issued a survey which was for individual women and groups of women to complete. We then had a series of events that went out into communities um, including accessing island and rural communities, uh, black and minority ethnic women and disabled women specifically um, using face-to-face uh, -face meetings and um, webinars as well. Uh, and we then sifted all of the evidence that came back to us, looking at specifically um, issues that were of concern to the committee that they'd identified in previous <coughs> examinations, um, going article by article through the treaty to see um, how things fit in with that framework, and looking at issues which were um, within the competence of the Scottish Government and Parliament to act. Um, and we put other issues relating to UK Government action or inaction into the Four Nations report that we developed with colleagues in Wales, Northern Ireland and um, England. Unfortunately, there's a word limit of 6,600 words, um, so we had many, many things we wanted to say, but um, had to compress quite significantly, as you will see. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, can I have a brief supplementary on a specific point, Convener? Uh, you, you mentioned their engagement with the, the racial equality groups, and I, I, I wondered if, um, if you took into account or... Uh, could comment on the Close the Gap um, report um, that was uh, released fairly recently. I've, I've actually put a motion in about Parliament, but, it's, but the main findings, I won't uh, go into it all either, three quarters of BME women in the workplace have experienced racism, discrimination, racial, racial prejudice and bias, while 42% indicated they experienced bullying, harassment or victimisation simply because they were a BME woman. And that the, you know, in order to tackle the labour market inequalities, particularly also where there is also wealth inequality, it's it's compounded. It's a necessary step for Scotland to realise its ambition for inclusive growth. Did did you come across that in, in some of the discussions that you had, and did you take that report into account? Unfortunately, that report was produced after um, the examination. Yes, um, Anna Ritchie Allen, who's the executive director of Close the Gap, was on our expert advisory group and was able to share some preliminary findings from some of their field work. Um, we are very much um, bereft of data on the experience of black and minority ethnic women in Scotland, um, which speaks to the convener's earlier point about the essential nature of data. And so I think Close the Gap have done a, a very strong piece of work. We also need, um, because the committee is unable to assess the quality of civil society produced reports. Um, they really rely on administrative data when we're communicating with them about specific problems. So I would hope that um, the committee would see Close the Gap's excellent report um, as an urge towards um, finding and securing administrative data on the experiences of black and minority ethnic women in the labour market. Um, but certainly the differential experience of black and minority ethnic women, um, disabled women and other groups of marginalised women um, is very much on the committee's mind and is interleaved in our report. Yeah. Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I just wondered whether you'd had a response from the Scottish Government on, uh, on the, the points raised in the civil society response. Um, we haven't had a formal response from Scottish Government to um, the concluding observations. It has not been their practice to respond formally to concluding observations, and I think that would be one of the systematic pieces of process we would want to see introduced, and certainly something which seems indicated in the recommendations from the First Minister's um, Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership as something which is important. At the moment, um, there is not a systematic approach to picking up concluding observations and then integrating them into action. No, but, but just, I mean, to be absolutely clear for the record, do you think there should there should be? We do think there should be, yes. Thank you. I know that that's that's I, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Mary Fee. Thank you, uh, Convener, and good morning, um, Emma. 
I wanted to ask you a bit more about um, this Parliament as a guarantor of human rights and how we could further progress the issue um, of, of women's rights, mainstreaming and, and, and equality. Um, and CEDAW have made a number of um, different concluding observations, and most of the things that they, um, they raise are things that this committee specifically ha has looked at, um, whether it's through inquiry or whether it's come up in, in, in inquiries that we've done. If, um, as a guarantor of human rights, um, the Scottish Government were to incorporate CEDAW into Scots law, are all the other parts of the jigsaw ready for that to happen? No, the other parts of the jigsaw aren't ready. I think um, I'd, I'd refer the committee certainly to a report produced by Professor Nicole Busby um, for Engender on the question of CEDAW incorporation directly. Um, she identifies a number of things that would have to happen in order to make that live, um, including a process by which um, cases were supported and run and case law would be developed over time. Um, because on the first day of incorporation, there wouldn't be case law. And so um, there would need to be a process of arriving at that in order to provide public bodies, including Scottish Government, with legal certainty about how they should approach decision making and how they should act. Um, there have been a number of approaches taken by states around the world to incorporating CEDAW, and I'm sure you're very familiar with um, the Wales example of incorporation of um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so it would be possible for Scotland to develop a suite of um, duties um, or other mechanisms to integrate uh, thinking about CEDAW into um, Scottish public bodies, thinking about equality and rights. It would even be possible, um, Professor Busby thinks, to integrate um, CEDAW into a revised and refreshed public sector equality duty in some measure so that public bodies would have to think about CEDAW when they were considering how to respond to that. Um, but certainly the pieces would not be in place and um, there would need to be concerted action on the part of public authorities, any regulator, um, the parliament, the government and civil society in order to make CEDAW a reality for women and girls. And I know the next question I'm going to ask you is, is asking you to do a, a guesstimate but if all of that work was to take place, how long do you think that, that could possibly take? I have absolutely no, no idea. idea. I mean, I think we can see that we are still... Um, we're still acting on and developing case law with regards mm. to the bits of the Equality Act that used to be the Equal Pay Act and used to be the Sex Discrimination mm. Act. So I think the work of equality and rights is mm. never done. Um, but I think that we could see some impact from any approach to integrating CEDAW into Scotland's thinking, just as in Wales we have seen the incorporation that they have done on the Convention of the Rights of the Child bearing some fruit in their public authorities. Mm. And the, the advisory, the government advisory group on human rights, could could they take a more proactive role in encouraging those things to happen? The sorry, who who was that? The the, the government's um, advisory group on human rights. Could they take a more proactive role in encouraging all those little bits to happen? Yes, I mean, I think the recommendations that have come forward from the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership um, did cover all of those questions. How this mm. might be. Um, implemented how it might be brought to life and um, the announcement has just come out as you'll be aware mm. that the new group has been formed to take this work forward um, and so I think that will be an urgent part of their work plan to think about not only what any bill or bills might look like but how all the rest of the work around that is done to make this work. Mm. And I, I was quite interested in um, the comment about um, getting committees to do thematic inquiries um, and even for this com committee, when we do budget scrutiny, it's very difficult to follow a line of spend through a budget. Do you think it would be helpful if, um, and I, I pose this as a, a possibility, not something that would happen, um, if every subject committee in Parliament, uh, over and above the work that they do, were asked every year to look at one thing, and each committee did a thematic inquiry into one specific thing, and then it was all pulled together at the end. Whether it's women in housing, women mental health, women in the justice system, if every, if every committee was to look at one, one specific thing, would that help? 
I mean, I would love every committee in this parliament to be considering women and equality all the time. Yeah, I um, but I appreciate that there mm -hmm. are lots of competing demands mm -hmm. on this place. Um, I think there are definitely considerations to be given to how all of the committees work together to, to focus on equality. Um, and there's been lots of discussion over time um, across many parliaments about how to do post-legislative scrutiny that thinks about women's equality and rights, whether rapporteurs are a useful feature of parliamentary committees. Um, so I think it, there's definitely some consideration to be done. I think the excellent work this committee did on thinking about human rights in the parliament could perhaps be emulated by a piece of work looking at equality in the parliament um, and seeing if there are any um, similar sets of recommendations that could come forward about how to um, grapple with those questions. Because I think some an idea, as you've mentioned, or, or some other similar ideas may have some merit. But I think what we would like to see is systematically an approach taken that is proportionate, but that does ensure that women and girls, equality and rights are thought about in all committees. And we are, after all, more than half of the population uh, and live still very distinct lives. So that is certainly something which should be done to ensure that good legislation and policy making happens. Yeah, and, and I suppose if, if each subject committee did even a very short thematic inquiry, it, it may help sharpen the mind or the thinking about how they specifically look at women. Perhaps indeed. OK, thank you. We're all for sharpening minds. Right. Yeah. Uh, Annie Wells. Thanks, Kim Good morning, Emma. Um, just a, a question from me on the letter that was sent to the Cabinet <laughs> Secretary and copied to the committee. Can you advise if you have received the response and what that response was? We have not yet received a response from the Cabinet Secretary. Fine. I can't ask what the response was there then. So <laughs> thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. OK. Emma, do you have anything further you would like to um, share with the committee or ask of the committee? Before you do, or while you're thinking about it, are, are you able to um, provide us with the information? I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of them. You said there was a, a sister organisation that let you know that the... Um, I'm trying to think of the correct term here. The Jews were paid by the UK <laughs> government. Absolutely. I will, yeah, I'll pass that correspondence on to you. Fantastic. Certainly, yes. I mean, I think the, the final call I would make would be to reiterate the calls of the beginning, um, that the, this committee has done um, some terrific work over time, some of which we drew on in our submission, particularly the inquiry into prejudice-based bullying and our ongoing concerns about um, the experience of girls in school and the impact on their education of experiencing epidemic sexual harassment and sexualised bullying. Um, but I think this committee has perhaps more work to do when it comes to thinking about women's equality and rights. And so I'd return to the, the calls that I made about how you might track these CEDAW concluding observations, um, how you might think about the articles of CEDAW when you're deciding which areas of work uh, to focus on. And, and again, the, treaty, the threat to the treaty bodies has not dissipated just because the UK government has now late paid its dues. Um, so how will you act to ensure that the CEDAW committee as an institution is preserved and protected and I think the question of CEDAW incorporation is really interesting and has, this conversation has just touched on the beginning of that so I would really urge the committee to um, give very considerable regard to um, that as, a, as an interesting question. Okay, thank you. Um, my colleague Mary Fee is making signs at me thank, that she has another you, question. Thank yeah. you, um, convener. Um, it was just when, when you were giving that answer there and you were talking about the concluding observations Perhaps instead of saying to committees to do a very short thematic inquiry on a specific thing, if each committee was tasked with looking at one concluding observation and doing an inquiry into that, would that be a more beneficial way of actually getting in-depth information? I think certainly because CEDAW is such a broad treaty and it covers really all elements of human life, um, I wonder if the, the committees might instead see all of the concluding observations and decide which ones are most relevant to their work, um, and that might be an approach. But I think these questions are certainly ones for this committee to consider in terms of how the rest of the parliament responds to um, women's equality and rights issues and specifically to CEDAW and other treaty bodies concluding observations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Um, certainly given us um, a lot to think about this morning. We appreciate your evidence. Thank you for coming in. The next meeting of the committee will be on Thursday, the 20th of June, where we'll consider the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill at Stage 2. Um, so I now close the meeting. <laughs>